First, I must begin with an apology to Cecile and the organizers. For weeks, they've been asking for my slides. I have struggled to put into a concrete form what I want to say to such an important and frankly intimidating crowd. I've also spent a year wrestling with cancer and a bone marrow transplant. I don't say this to get sympathy, maybe a little, but I have found that this experience has given me a new perspective on things that I'm still trying to integrate. At once, I am grateful for just about everything, but I also tend to be less patient with things I feel need to be changed. And to be clear, as I look out at my home country and across the Atlantic, I see some need for change. This crystallized for me when preparing for this talk. I kept coming across the phrase memory organizations. If indeed, as Satyana was right in saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, then what obligations does that place upon institutions who are charged as memory keepers of nations? I would argue that as stewards of cultural heritage, we are also stewards of society. I would also argue that we must stop serving communities and start building them. Our communities, our societies, our cultures are too important to sit on the sidelines and simply observe or collect their output. We must recognize, without the haze of nostalgia, that we are actors in this world and accept a responsibility to work directly with communities of all types to shape a better tomorrow. Now, this could and should take many forms. Confronting growing economic disparity, alerting the world to the dangerous mix of xenophobia and nationalism, or confronting the realities of a climate crisis. I could talk about the continuous marginalizations of whole segments of the population because of race or class or sexual preference. Marginalization by society, and indeed, all too often by librarians and the libraries they manage. Today, however, I would like to use just one small major societal issue to support a call for national libraries to directly build communities. This incredibly consequential issue often goes unnoticed. It is the dangerous aspects of an increased reliance on data-driven algorithms generated by artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. Before I begin, as a good academic, let me throw out a few caveats and cl cl mm, clarifications. Excuse me. The use of data, when appropriately gathered and analyzed, is incredibly powerful. Indeed, it underlies most of science. The rise of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and indeed big data has unquestionably brought massive benefits to many disciplines. The ability to search through trillions of pages in milliseconds, to search across massive collections of images, and the ability to automate complex processes have directly benefited librarians. The issue, as I see it, is when we believe that data gathering, analysis, and encoding into algorithms are somehow neutral acts without societal costs. In terms of uh, clarifications, I will use the term community a lot. That is often seen as synonymous with towns or citizens of a city. I use the term more broadly. When I say communities, I mean a group of people joined by some known variable, and that group of people shares a means of allocating limited resources. A town is indeed a community, sharing a common location and a system of governance that allocates land, taxes, and other resources. A university is also a community, a community of scholars, staff, students, and administrators. A community can be a law firm, or a hospital, or a national library. The other caveat, one last caveat, is on the topic of national libraries. I have done some work with national libraries, but much of my relevant experience is working with state libraries here in the U.S. 
And there's an old joke that once you know one state library, you know one state library. I don't pretend to be an expert on European national libraries. However, from what I've seen, this is also true of your organizations and institutions. Some of you are active in networks with public and academic libraries. In some countries, there are multiple national library agencies. Some actively seek to support business and entrepreneurs. Others focus on scholarly research. Bottom line, no one set of issues or models will reflect your great variety. I get it. That said, I am reminded also of the saying, every idea is a good idea in libraries, just not in my library. It is very easy to focus on what differentiates us now and believe that prevents collective action in the future. I hope I can successfully persuade you otherwise. So with the caveats and clarifications out of the way, my purpose today is to recruit you all to build a network of proactive librarians around Europe. I am calling on you to directly support, train, and empower librarians from those working in the most rural public library to those in the most prestigious academic library. What's more, I am asking you to engage in community building to, to shape for a better future. Why? Well, let's start with a story. Charles Duhigg, uh, author of The Power of Habit, tells the story of an angry father who storms into a department store to confront the store manager. It seems the store has been sending his 16-year-old daughter a huge number of coupons for pregnancy-related items, diapers, baby lotion, and such. The father asks the manager if the store is trying to encourage his, the girl to get pregnant. The manager apologizes to the man and assures him the store will stop immediately. Being service oriented, a few days later, the manager calls the father only to find out that the daughter was indeed pregnant and the store knew it before she told her father. What's remarkable is that the store knew it before the girl ever told a soul. The store had determined her condition from looking at what product she was buying, activity on a store credit card, and in crunching through huge amounts of data. If we updated this story from a few years ago to today, we could also include it crunching her search history, her online shopping, even her shopping at other physical stores. It is now common practice to use online tracking, Wi-Fi connections, uh, unique identifiers to merge data across a person's entire life. I'm hardly telling you anything new here. Facebook is only the latest business to dominate the headlines around privacy breaches and little things like hidden data gathering. Most citizens of the EU and the US now live two lives, their own and one created often without their knowledge from the digital debris created through our devices. Add to this the increased requirement by governments and businesses alike to be online. You have to be online to apply for a job, to vote, to receive health care, to listen to music. And we see a world that is moving faster than regulation and faster than the realization by those we seek to serve. In Toronto, Sidewalks Lab, a subsidiary of Alphabet, Google's parent company, is working with town planners to redevelop Toronto's eastern waterfront. Now, the story of transforming old industrial areas into gentrified multi-use spaces is nothing new. However, a large part of the controversy in this case comes in the plan to make the new neighborhood a data generator. The plan, according to The Intercept, quote, includes a centralized identity management system through which each residence accesses public services such as library cards and health care, unquote. There's been a large debate over who owns and controls the data generated by that system and who can profit from it. Many librarians might look at these examples and claim a sort of ethical high ground. 
After all, as a profession, we explicitly value privacy. In the US, we count it as our core value, and yet we often undermine it. We tell our online patrons that we don't track their work, and yet the internet provider they use can indeed track every click they make. Therefore, we are often misleading that patron and giving them a false sense of security. How many libraries go the extra step to set up a Tor server or anonymous VPN services for our service populations? How often in our licensing of databases and other software do we explicitly forbid the aggregation of user data or the selling of that data? If we do, how often do we check on those terms? Then there is the question of how all of this data is used. In her book, Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill, a data scientist, documents story after story of data mining and algorithms that have massive effects in people's lives, even when they show clear biases and faults. For example, an algorithm led to outstanding teachers being fired. How? O'Neill writes about an outstanding teacher who had proven positive effect, uh, sort of genius even, on underperforming students, raising those students' grades significantly. As a reward, the teacher was given a year with honors classes filled with the brightest students in the school. However, the impact a teacher can have on honor students is not nearly as evident as those helping students with needs. A lot of help. After all, top students receiving top marks can't get better than, well, top marks. So the algorithm saw a teacher that was no longer effective in a classroom and recommended the teacher be fired. A recommendation by a piece of software using a criteria that was hidden from teachers and was assumed to be objective. Algorithms are now used here in the States to determine healthcare costs and availability, access to credit for home ownership, suitability of a candidate for a job, and even how long a person should be in jail. Yuval Harari refers to this reliance on collectible data and algorithms as dataism. It is the result of computing power combined with machine learning and the wide availability of constantly connected devices, like our phones. It is the belief that if you gather enough data on a person or situation, you can accurately represent that person or situation and predict an outcome. It often also comes with some very dubious and downright dangerous assumptions. Assumptions such as algorithms are objective and that data collection is somehow a neutral act, or even that everything can be represented in a quantitative way, including, by the way, culture. And before I make you wonder what any of this has to do with the work of libraries or think I'm letting the profession off the hook, I have to say that librarians have suffered from some of the same dubious assumptions in our work. For too long, librarians and library science educators saw ourselves as neutral actors. We collected, described, and provided materials believing that these acts were either without bias or that those biases were controlled. In collecting, we took it all, except for works that were self-published or from sources we deemed predatory or low quality. Oops. In cataloging, we relied on literary warrant and the language of the community, often ignoring that we only saw the language of the dominant narrative and voices within that community. Our services were for all, from nine to five with a researcher's card who could travel. As a profession, we are now waking up to the fact that we are a product of our culture and all the good and bad that comes with that. We understand that the choices we make in everything from classification to exhibits are just that, choices. They may be guided by best practice or enforced by law, but ultimately they are human choices in a material world 
where resource decisions must be made. We can speed up digitization with newer machines, but we still have to pick a starting point for that digitization. We can expand our services to those on the web, but we must acknowledge that there are people with no broadband or connectivity. Now, it would seem like this may be a call to redouble our efforts in neutrality, a call to wipe away the biases in ourselves so that we can confront the costs to society of skewed machine learning. But it's not. In fact, we must embrace that libraries and the librarians that build and manage them are biased. What's more, it is only by seeing libraries as biased that we prove our value in a world of massive scale data. First, we must realize that it is impossible to be neutral. Putting a book on a shelf or in a vault is a choice. Every day in archives and special collections, we make professional determinations of how accessible an item is versus how protected it is. We can seek out other voices and yes, gather data to make those decisions. But in the end, they are decisions with consequences. Pretending we are neutral doesn't change the consequences. It only allows us to pretend that they're not the result of our actions. Now, I keep calling them biases, but a better word would be principles. Principles are an explicit statement of belief. They should be transparent and most importantly, able to be assessed. We need to be able to answer the question, are we following our principles? And make no mistake that principles are neutral. Seeking to serve all equitably takes effort and resources. Choosing to provide images for fee or free is a choice. Fighting censorship is a decision. If you don't think so, try balancing it against the issues of hate speech and threats to marginalized communities. It is in our decisions and our transparency in making those decisions that we build trust with our communities. Our scholars and entrepreneurs and citizens don't trust librarians because we are neutral, but because they agree with our principles and see them consistently applied. The days when libraries had the monopoly on access to large collections is well over. Yet libraries in most places in the world are not only in use, but in growing use, public, academic, school, and national libraries alike. Where library use, not necessarily support, but use, is growing, it is because we are seen as accessible, equitable, and trusted. Yes, the collections we hold are valuable. The fact that we hold unique resources that either haven't been or can't be digitized is important, but is only important if those who seek out these resources trust us to be honest stewards of those resources. It is our embrace of our humanity, our human touch in an increasingly automated system that underlies our value. This is not a light eight's call against technology, AI, or machine learning. Rather, it is a belief that human connection, community, is more important than ever when we, the face of government and businesses alike become web pages and bots under the banner of austerity or efficiency. The future of libraries is ultimately not set by which technologies are developed or deployed. It is not in a value that was defined a century ago. It is in our very human ability to build trust with our communities. It is upon that trust that we build support. It is upon that trust that we build use. It is upon that trust that we find and confirm our necessity. It is with that trust that we must reach out to the computer science community, the online industry, and the governments collecting data and deploying algorithms. We must advocate for a seat at the table and represent the voices of those without a seat. We must use the hard lessons we learned and are still learning 
in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion to help guide these technologies. We must be trusted by our communities to speak truth to power and give those communities power to speak for themselves. We must follow our principles in actively shaping with our communities the policies, regulations, and laws that talk about data. National libraries must play a large role in civic data stewardship. National libraries must not just safeguard the heritage of cultures, but the privacy and intellectual safety of citizens. You need to be a memory organization in the realization that effective memory is both about remembering and forgetting. How do I resolve the paradox that I just advocated for a common role in institutions that I also acknowledge are so diverse? If indeed you each represent a unique institution, does this preclude collective action? Of course not. Because in effect, you are what all libraries must become. Every library, public, academic, school, legal, special, medical, should be shaped to the communities they serve. Then, as librarians, we become the connective tissue that seeks the best of all libraries and shape those innovations to local needs. Gone are the days when every library looked alike or supported some canon of common, common services. Gone are the days when best practice is extended to all libraries of a given size or type. Throw away the toolkits and instead build a toolbox. We must prepare our librarians, regardless of title or training or location, to be a missionary force, proactively engaging in the well-being of our cultures and communities. We must build national peer networks that rapidly and effectively spread ideas and help librarians effectively shape those ideas to meet local needs. These networks discard best practices and industrial standardization for conversation, learning, and adaptation. We must connect the best thinkers together regardless of status or institutional boundaries. How do important national institutions do this? We must create platforms for continuous engagement of librarians where they can share, learn, teach, mentor, and support each other. This may be built upon and with national and regional associations, but the focus is on individuals, not institutions. We must create a system to formally recognize participants within and beyond these platforms. Work with library science programs where they exist, but also extend the recognition beyond formal degrees to a model of continuous learning. We must recognize lighthouse libraries, these outstanding libraries that embody innovation and serve as inspirations, not blueprints, for other libraries. We must proactively engage this network of change agents to transform libraries, associations, institutions, and ultimately communities globally. Members of our peer networks, of our communities of practice, must encounter daily new ideas from across the globe. Think of the library as a movement, not as a place or an institution. It is a movement of people committed to improving society. Librarians, certainly, but also scholars, politicians, entrepreneurs, programmers, and authors. Discard terms like user that reinforce the idea that our communities are consumers and that our only value is in the utility we provide to a given demand. We have members and citizens, neighbors and scholars that all own and shape the library. Most importantly, this will not happen in one hour of one conference. It will take more engagement, more experimentation, and more investment. That is why I support the PL2030 project. Building off of the Public Libraries 2020 project, it is a group of librarians across the continent seeking to transform public libraries one librarian at a time. It advocates for libraries 
and builds connections between representatives, elected representatives, and the library innovators. But it needs help. PL 2030 and the work of its members represent the need for a new vital link between cultural heritage mission of national libraries and public libraries. Libraries are transforming from access points, collections, and information providers into community hubs across Europe, from Manchester to Cologne, to the amazing Dock One in Aarhus, to Delft and Tilburg in the Netherlands, and Pistoia and Perugia in Italy, public libraries are the place communities come to learn, create, and dream together. Here, by the work of innovative librarians, libraries have gone from quiet places of retreat to loud places of engagement. The true collection of a great library is now the community itself. Blacksmiths and bakers host conversations. Librarians lend out books and musical instruments and recording studios. Rather than bringing the world to the community, these libraries have become loudspeakers, broadcasting the community to the world. These public libraries have become the cradle of cultural creation. As institutions charged, in part, with preserving and supporting the cultural heritage of a people, you need to preserve and support the work of these institutions. Not simply as a backup or for posterity, but as part of a living and breathing center of a community conversation. In a connected world, connected through technology certainly, but also in trade, in governance, and in preserving the earth itself, there is no more frontline service and library of last resort. We librarians are obligated to serve all. And in your nations, now, is a network of libraries eager for your partnership. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to the conversation to come.